Good evening, everyone. We will make our way to our seats, get ready to come into the presence of the Lord. I've been ready all day for this. I don't know about y'all, but the Lord is great. The Lord is doing big things. He's working. Today I was uh, running a route, and uh, a guy I haven't seen in some years, and uh, I used to work there back in the day before I was in church, and he was, I was standing at the table, and I was just looking out at the shop, just reminiscing on the things that I used to do out there, and he walked up to me and asked me how I was doing, I said, good, I said, he was like, you look different. I was like, yeah. I was like, uh, started living for the Lord around probably 10 years ago, probably. Amen. And uh, he said, it shows. He said, it, he said it glowing off of you. And, you know, it is something to the inside of me because I don't always see that in myself sometimes. I look at the, the trials that I go through. I look at the times that I fall short. But... I don't look at what the Lord has did in my life all the time. And it, it, it kind of spoke to me today. So no matter what we go through, no matter what, he's the light that shines, that shines through us. And uh, it's, it's a good thing. I, it, it really hit me. It really hit me today. And I just I wanted to share that tonight. But we're going to go into prayer. Uh, anybody here on my right have a request? Brother Gio. Brother Cody. All right. Sister Crystal. Uh, my dad's still in prayer and my brother David is praying also. Yes, ma'am. Brother Cody. <laughs> we sure will. Sister Rita. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sister Judy. Yes, ma'am, we will. Sister Shauna. Yes, ma'am. Sister Ann Margaret. Yes, ma'am, we will. Brother Ronnie. Yes, ma'am. Sister Nadine. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am, we will. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. else on my left? Yes, ma'am. It sure will. Anyone on the phone? Okay, Sister Bill. Sure will. Sister Kim? All right. Yes. Oh.
Yes, sir. We'll keep him in our prayer. Sister Crystal. We know our Lord that'll heal every every need. If you would, let's go to the let's go to the Lord with these needs tonight. Lord, we love you. Lord, we're thankful for you and the things that you are doing in our lives, Lord. Lord, we just ask you to touch every need that was taking place. going to get right into offering as well. Sister Heidi, if you would get the ways to give on the board, please. We have GiveLify. We have PayPal at RiverbendPentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, PO Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. We got text to give. 833-883-9311. This prayer that we say over our offering and our tithings is, is good. I've uh, been blessed with it, and I love it. I'm thankful for this prayer. If you have faith, say it tonight with me if you would, please. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings, and I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken, I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, Checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, deaths demolished, and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God, perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, and I am blessed going out, and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. Come give.
come on, church. If you're thankful for the name, let's do it. Let's give you some praise tonight in here. Let's worship him. If he's brought you through hell this week, if he's touched your body and healed you this week, let's give him some praise. There's power in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm thankful. I'm thankful that I know that there's power in the name. There's healing power. When we know somebody that is sick, we can lay hands on them and pray in Jesus' name, and they will be healed. That's right. Amen. Amen. If everyone as a teacher, student, or faculty of the school, if you would come to the front, we want to pray over you tonight. All the kids. There's power in prayer. Sometimes I wish I could go back to school where I didn't have to go to work. <laughs> uh, Let me have your attention real quick. Real quick. I know y'all y'all screw down a little bit down that away. These these uh these little boys down on the end here like to just crowd in the corner. But uh school starts Monday. Um and I would make an argument that hell wants who you're looking at right here more than anybody else. That's right. uh, at the risk of sounding macabre or uh, uh, inappropriate, Adolf Hitler said, give me your young people and I'll rule your country. Uh, and hell is after these kids. So we're going to take a minute and we're going to pray a covering over them. And I'd like for you to say that when you pray. Pray a covering of the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the power of the Holy Ghost. Plead the blood over them. It, I know some of you know what that means. Plead the blood over them. Because, and you better pray for them all the time. But sure enough, we're going to launch them out of here tonight. And we'll probably do something again Sunday. But I really told Brother Terrence, let's just do the offering, pray, sing a song, and then let's cover these kids and these teachers and these all that are working for the school. You all know how serious this is? You can't do anything. You will not have done anything more important today than this. Now, I don't care if they're laughing, cutting up, playing. Guess what they are? Kids. Kids. We sometimes forget we used to be kids. The reason why we forget is you're not a kid very long. It doesn't last long at all. So how many of you will pray with us? We're going to let Brother Terrence lead us in prayer. It's a praying rascal right here. God's already changing him. We're going to let Brother Terrence lead us in prayer, but you're going to stretch your hand toward these kids and pray with authority and faith. Pray with faith like every one of them, like the, every one of these is your kid. Can you do that? Let's go. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray tonight over these kids, children right now. Lord, we just ask you to put a covering over them, Lord. Build a hedge of protection around them, oh God. Lord, I pray that there, there is angels with them, when, Lord, when they go to school, Lord. Protect their minds and their heart, Lord. Lord, I pray that nothing can enter into them that's going to throw them off course of where you are heading, where you are taking them. Lord, I pray Oh, 
if the kids would like to go back, you are ready. You you are dismissed tonight. I'm ready for bro what Brother Gio has got for us tonight. Yeah. It's always good. It's always powerful. I'm thankful that he is my pastor. I'm thankful that he lets me be on his team. Amen. I'm thankful for Brother Terrence, too. Amen. You can be seated. We're using the same handout from last week, so I know everybody has them, except those that weren't here. Everybody didn't bring theirs back. We have, make sure our guests get one. I made about 20 copies because I had faith that many, many, many were going to bring theirs back. Uh, are we going to need more than 20? I'm sorry. Did you take it home and read it? Then you're excused from bringing it back then. Y'all just visit all you want to because I want y'all to be comfortable because you might be there a minute. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So, so this is the first time she can do her anything, but in here it's seven weeks. Really yeah. was, uh, it was seven weeks ago today. So. All right. I'm glad you're back. <laughs> yeah, we're glad you're back for sure. For sure. And uh, um, we have some folk missing today. Yes, ma'am. Oh, you need a handout. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, Shelly played hooky last Wednesday. No, I, I'm just teasing. She was sick. She was sick. I know where she let me know where she was, or I think she did it through my wife, but that counts. And, uh, um, but uh, I... I want to make sure you have your hand out because uh, um, uh, um, this, what we're going to talk about tonight, um, I don't know. I told you last week we're going to put the shovel in the ground and turn over no telling what. And... Uh, um, and we're, we're going to unpack it again tonight. And uh, but let's uh, let's just get to moving because I I, would, I really like to get through with this lesson tonight. The book of Jude is generally believed to be written by the man whose name it bears, Jude or Judas or Judah. Uh, appears he was the half brother of Jesus Christ. Same. Mama, different daddies, and uh, it looks like that he was present on the day of Pentecost in the upper room and there received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Um, and uh, Acts 1 and 14 tells us Mary and the, the brethren of Jesus were in the upper room, and Acts 2, 1 through 4 said everybody in the upper room received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And uh, so... Um, it's addressed to those that are called, sanctified, and preserved... And uh, sanctified means set aside, especially for God. Preserved means kept by Jesus Christ. And this is after you've been called. Everybody's called. Not everybody positions themselves to be sanctified or kept. Because God's not going to keep you if you're not in the right place. But he's going to pull you out of it. And uh, so Jude prayerfully sought direction in writing these believers a letter. This was written to church folks, not the sinners. And uh, he prayerfully sought direction in writing them a letter. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to both church folks and sinners. But this is written to church folks. It's important to know the context. He said, I was, I was seeking after writing you a letter regarding the common salvation. And that doesn't mean just like any old 
run-of-the-mill salvation, but the fact that salvation in this setting was common. They all received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They just like the day of Pentecost. And uh, so the salvation was common uh, among everybody. It's the same experience that it was for these believers as it was the apostles and all true believers since the day of Pentecost that we learned about in Acts chapter 2. But Jude, when he was led, said, The Spirit led me to tell you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, the being a definite article, the faith, which means the entire body of beliefs that make up the salvation experience, the plan of salvation, everything that's given to us in the Bible. And when he says it was once delivered to the saints, we've learned that that means once and for all. Okay, there's not going to be a new revelation there and a new revelation here, but it is that which was from the beginning. With me? Good. And he said it was delivered to the saints. Those that first received the baptism of the Holy Ghost were called saints. Saints comes from the Greek word hagios, which means by being like the Lord, they are unlike the world. Okay? Being unlike the world is elementary to being like the Lord. The closer you get to Jesus Christ, the less you will be like the world. Look, smell, taste, behave, etc. You get further and further. Because the further you get toward Jesus, the further you get from the world. But that's not enough to just say I'm not like the world, so I'm all right. Okay, now, when he called them saints, it was a, uh, uh, a shot across the bow, if you will. It, was, uh, it encapsulates the overarching purpose of the letter in that there is a difference between the way of the world and the people of God, and the devil wants you to, he wants to eliminate that difference. Does that make sense? It is the mission of hell. To blur the lines between heaven and earth, right and wrong, holy and unholy. Jude 1 and 4, for there are certain men crept in unawares. He's talking about their church. Don't get hung up on the idea that you need to think about who is this in our church. All right? That's not what it's talking about. Though it could happen. Okay, there could be knuckleheads come in just to cause trouble. And what has happened is, is there's certain men that have crept into this church and nobody knew it, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. It was prophetically told that there are going to be people come in and try to tear you down. They are ungodly men, which means the exact opposite of God. How do you know if somebody's ungodly or not? There you go. The way they behave. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. That beautiful word. I'm going to ask everybody to spell that next week. Just teasing. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only God and our Lord, the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this was written to a body of believers in the last 25 years of the first century. So from about 75 to 100 AD is when this was written. And it was a time when the church, though it was in the infant stages, all right, the, whole, the day of Pentecost was on or about 30 AD. 29, 30 AD was the day of Pentecost. So we're between uh, 45 and 70 years after the Holy Ghost has fallen. It's, that's very short. That may be even less than my life expectancy or my life that I've lived so far. I hope my expectancy is longer than that. But the, the church could have been about my age at this point, okay? But they are under attack already with people trying to water down truth. It has happened since the beginning, all right? They are being assaulted by heresies and perversions, things people are preaching, trying to modify the truth. The, the thing that is under attack preeminently is the lordship of Jesus Christ. Hear me as I tell you, 
Jesus Christ is not one God of many. He is the one God manifest in flesh. The only living God is Jesus Christ. Okay? All right. And they want to destroy that. They don't say it, but the truth is they want to convince people that they are in effect God themselves. Ultimately, that's where they want to go. There are two areas that are primarily under attack. The first is doctrinal truth. Okay, that's what is taught. The plan of salvation, the death, the burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, everything that's in the book is under attack along with a lifestyle of holiness and separation from the world. So the reader of this letter that Jude addressed it to needs to be aware that there are men and women attending their church who are on a mission from hell. Their mission is destruction by division. And the way they divide the church is by introducing worldliness. Now the trouble occurs when the worldliness, living like the world, acting like the world, behaving like the world, is excused and the grace of God is what excuses it. You with me? All right. They have changed the message to say, because of the grace of God, you can do whatever you want to do. You can be a little bit of a sinner or you can be a bad, low down, no good for nothing sinner. And you're still all right because of the grace of God. Okay. That's what they're saying. It's important to realize that these are active presently. That's why God had Jude write this letter. And it appears, appears nothing. They're, the people that want to divide the church, it worked. What Jude warned them about came to pass. Okay? Now, this is a picture and please understand, those that are watching online, those that are in the house with us, this is not meant as disrespect. This is meant as a challenge. This is a picture of the majority of the religious world today. And they did not get there because they were malicious, shady, trying to get something over on God, etc. They got there. There are people that believe this very thing today. All right? I can be bad because of the grace of God. Now, that violates Scripture. I'm going to show that to you in a little bit. But it's a complete violation of Scripture. Matter of fact, in Romans 6 and 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, okay? The Lord doesn't want that. He's not giving you a license to be bad. He's giving you an avenue to arrive. Okay, now, um, Jude's warning to this group of believers and others apparently was either pridefully ignored, which would be what? If they pridefully ignored it, that means that they're thinking, hey, ain't, nothing, ain't nothing to me. I got this. Who you think you're talking to, man? I got this. Man, throw that, throw that letter in the trash. Or his warning was lustfully rejected, which would be referring to the attraction of having my sinful desires catered to. You mean you can make a way for me to be saved and do whatever I want to? I'm in. Right? Right? I'm in because now I, I want to say this real quickly. Be very careful. Be very careful because the Bible says every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. The way you, the way you and I sin is the enemy allows us to have what our flesh wants. Right. 
I'm, I'm going to say this real quickly and then I'm going to move on because I'm really trying to move and groove tonight. But for instance, I, this is not to brag. This is just telling you what it is. I ain't never had a drink of alcohol in my life. Not a drink. All right, I come from a long line of drunks. I got scared to death by my uncle when I was a little boy, tried to beat the front door down of our house to get to his wife who we were hiding because he was a drunkaholic. All right? So my point is, devil ain't bringing a bottle of Jack Daniels and letting me find it on my front porch to try to tear me down. But he does know where I'm weak at. So there ain't going to, you know, the devil ain't going to uh, uh, have, you know, Sister Maria invite me to go to Swinging Grannies. All right? That ain't how he's going to work on me. He ain't, he's smarter than that. But he does know where my weaknesses are and the things I struggle with and the things that I have to do like this and say, oh, my goodness, where did that come from? That's right. That's right. That's right. No. All right? And that's what he presents to me. And that's where I sin. Listen to me. When you sin, it didn't surprise you. You knew it was coming. Because the Bible says, come on, little Holy Ghost moving in here right now. The Bible says, he will not allow you to be tempted above that which he will not also make a way of escape. There's always the choice to turn away from sin and not mess up. You always got a choice. Now, unfortunately, Brother Blake, I don't win that test all the time. But I'm happy to tell you, with the help of the Holy Ghost, Brother Jerry, I'm winning it more and more every day. And the bait of Satan and elements class. Now the Bible tells us in the end time there are going to be one of the signs of the end time is there are going to be folks that have a form of godliness. All right. They're religious, but they don't believe in the power of the Holy Ghost to keep you free from sin. Okay. Now. It's written in the last 25 years of the first century. The enemy has been preparing some folks to come in and destroy the church. And Jude said, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you or encourage you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once and for all delivered unto the saints. And of course, Hagio saints is holy folks. I'm using that. People that as they become more like the Lord are less like the world. Okay. In short, the mission of the enemy is to change that which they had continued in. According to Acts chapter number 2, these continued in one accord in breaking of bread from house to house in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. All right, they want to break them all from what they've continued in since the beginning, which was, according to Jude, the common salvation which was delivered once and for all. When they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? May I introduce to you the plan of salvation. As long as I'm the pastor, that's going to hang there. Brother McKinney, Brother Pete, Brother Johnny, at least those three had over 3,000 views on their funeral. That means 3,000 plus people are going to see the plan of salvation when they watch it. If one person goes to the Bible and says, reckon what that says, and looks it up, it's been worth it. All right? That's why it's up there. Don't that look nice? That's why it's there. I know it ain't the coolest decoration in the world, but don't mess with it. It's there. It's there. I remember when Dan Scott came to church here, he painted on the side of his barn, Old Bay Acts 238. Anybody remember that? They was talking about it at school. They was talking about it at jobs. People all over southeast Missouri was talking, what does that mean? Anybody remember that? Huh? Big old red letters, Old Bay Acts 238 on the side of his barn on Interstate 55. 
Now, that's why that's up there. That's when it was once and for all delivered. Right there. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Now, so, now these, these people that have crept in, they aren't doing away with the grace of God. They're not trying to come in and preach against the grace of God, but they are in effect preaching a message that says, if we don't sin, really what good is grace? We need to give grace something to do. Here's the deal. We sin. That's what they're preaching. We sin and grace doesn't care because the Lord understands that we're messed up anyway. So now grace just comes in and saves us and because we're corruptible humans, we get a pass. They are in effect promoting free operation and I'm not going to stay here all night like I did last time. They are in effect promoting free operation up and down the if it feels good, do it continuum. Meaning if I walk away just a little bit from the narrow path or if I go hog wild and buck crazy down there somewhere, you know, hanging out in the barn with animals and junk. That's the world we live in. Come on now, I'm, I'm not being ugly, but I'm just going to be plain. There are movements afoot in European countries as we speak to make pedophilia an alternative lifestyle. There are people now arguing for that right for adults to have sexual relations with children in the world we live in right now, that it's okay. All right, that's where this was headed. Please don't, don't think, oh, I can't believe he said that in church. It's the world you live in. And the way they got, oh, the way they got there is the Lord sent a warning to the church and said, don't back down whatever you do. Preach truth, live truth, hold on to truth, believe the Bible. Oh, I feel a little anointing getting on me right now. Whatever you do is all right. The free gift of salvation through the grace of God makes room for any and all lifestyle choices. The Lord decided, I said this the other day, basically what they're preaching, Brother Blake, is the Lord said, I done wiped these people out one time, getting rid of sin, it didn't work, so I'm going to go down, put myself in flesh, live, die, and rise again because I can't beat them. I'm just going to give up and make a way for them to be like ever they want to be and we'll all sing Kumbaya together. Now, excuse me if I'm being a little facetious, but the pulpit commentary said, this is talking about that word lascivious, lasciviousness, it said the thing to which that grace was perverted is described by a word, lasciviousness, of wide and evil application denoting every species of unbridled conduct all the way down to unblushing licentiousness. And licentiousness is defined as a throwing off of sexual restraint lewd character or behavior, wanton disregard or transgression of laws, rules, or moral norms. It is what the Bible says. They have come in to take you to a place where you will feel like you've lost your mind. And then, here's new stuff. Boy, I ain't doing too bad. <laughs> the end game is not to see how many sins they can make you commit. The end game is denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one Lord. 
but they want to deny him, Brother Ronnie. That's the end game. And you know how they get there? It's because you spiral to the point where you no longer, this is Bible, I'm not going to unpack it, but sin takes you to a place where you no longer know right from wrong. The term is called reprobate. And you will begin to question. Every time I go to church, all I hear is thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that. I want to go somewhere where they love me. Really, that, that's the world we live in right now. But let me tell you something, and especially for those of you that have been around here since Moby Dick was a sardine, the world don't feel that way no more. The world is looking for somebody to preach truth. The world is looking for something that's different, something that changes them, something that changes the way they've been living, something that, hear me now, something that establishes some clear standards of behavior, high level of commitment, and then holds you to it. I'm telling you right now, we're at a place where the world is tired of vanilla religion. Oh, let me tell you something. Go look it up. Google it. Google it. The Pentecostal church, and I say that in the broadest term, which means that they believe you have a spiritual experience at salvation, namely being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking other tongues, is the fastest growing movement in the world. Right now. Oh, listen to me. Listen to me. I'm telling you right now. I, <clears throat> there are... I know I'm going out on TV. A lot of people are going to see this, but there are presently Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Catholics, and people of all different religious denominations being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence in speaking in other tongues. It's happening all over the world. We are very close to being the largest movement in India. Very close. Because, Sister Maria, people like the fact that they found out God's not just a story and he's not just a cool thing in December and Easter time, but he's real and he's personal and he's powerful and you can have him living within you. Oh, hear me right now. You don't have to call yourself Pentecost to go to heaven, but you have to obey the word of God to go to heaven. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not blowing smoke. Look it up. It's not very common knowledge, but one of them denominations that I just listed right there, that in the United States will kick you out of their church for speaking in tongues, voted as a body in 2015, seven years ago, to allow their foreign missionaries to speak in other tongues actively and preach the Holy Ghost. Boy, it better be good because I'm on a road. There were no subtle nuances about obeying Acts 2.38. None. Uh-uh. Yes. There's nothing subtle about it. Okay. Nothing. Nothing. Uh-uh. And over in Acts 3 and Acts number 4, Peter says he gives the Holy Ghost to them that obey him. And they liked it so much they tried to kill him. True. You can look it up. So, oh, excuse me, I just got a little excited because I'm I got the Holy Ghost and stuff, and that's what we do when we come to church. I want, you to, I want you to hear this. Denying, this wasn't in my notes last week. Denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. If I said somebody denied the Lord, what would you think? What would your picture be? 
Ja, jeg tænkte, nej. I bet you right now the devil is beating himself down and he's whooping whatever little imp that did not stop Dorothy from getting to the mission. He's mad right now. If somebody denies the Lord, our picture is atheism or something like that. They just say, don't believe in God no more. It's not true. That's not what this means. Okay? This is the end result that the powers of hell desire. Please hear me. They aren't denying him from the aspect of saying there is no God. But they are denying him from the aspect of saying God is working on me, but you can't tell it. That didn't make sense, did it? They're not saying there's no God. They're saying, I serve God, but you can't tell it. Making sense now? I live for God, but you can't tell it because I act like everybody else. I look like everybody else. I behave like everybody else. I talk like everybody else. You know what? I think we're all saved. Do you know that's a movement? That with Calvary, every human being that was ever born all of a sudden became saved? But that, that, do you understand? They're not denying that God exists. They're denying the power of God to change their life. As a matter of fact, preaching, I'm saved, but you can't tell it. And that's all right. I don't treat people different. I don't behave different. I get out, shake my booty on the dance floor like all the other girls. And guys, when there's no difference between the saints and the sinners, the Lord has been denied. When there's no difference between the saints and the sinners, the Lord has been denied. We don't need him no more. You hear what I'm saying? I got this. Okay? Am I, is that, are we all right on that? Everybody all right on that? The denying the Lord is you don't have the power to deny the Lord anywhere but in your life. Because the Bible... Is everybody with me on this? Huh? I know that Hollywood will make you think that everybody's an atheist now. That's a lie. Over 85% of the people in the United States of America still believe in God to some degree. Think about this just a minute. Having a form of godliness, but... But what? Denying the power thereof. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved than the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Ooh, okay. Are we are we are y'all with me on that? Yes. Denying him is declaring there are parts of my life. Ain't nobody telling me what to do. Ain't nobody messing with that. And you know what happens, Brother Blake, when I want to stay there? I just change what I believe. Yeah. 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 
Okay. Now these next verses, everybody all right? Everybody all right? Okay. These next verses speak warnings. Warnings, please forgive me once again, but warnings that in effect obliterate the doctrine of eternal security. Eternal security needs the if it feels good, do it continuum to even be applicable. I don't believe once you're saved, you're always saved. But I believe you can be. I believe in the hope of eternal security, but I don't believe once you get it, you always got it. If that's the case, why is Jude 5, 6, and 7 in the Bible? Look at here. The warning is, don't think that because you were once saved, as it were, that you are free from the responsibility to continue to grow and press toward the mark, as Paul said it, and to align yourself with Jesus Christ and continually grow. The Bible says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. If you stop growing, you started dying. Can't have it both ways. Look at here. If you're standing still, you got left behind. Because this train is bound for glory. And this river, what river? I was hoping you would ask. And that great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and said, He that believeth on me as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Let me tell you something, honey. It's impossible to get back in the river the same place you got out of it. You want to know why? Because the river don't stop flowing. And this church ain't going to stop growing. And if you decided to just put the brakes on and stand still, you will be left behind. All right. Jude 1, 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance. What does that mean? I want to remind you. Let me remind you about this. Though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt. Y'all know what that's talking about? Somebody tell me real fast what that's talking about. The Exodus, Brother Blake. That's exactly right. How did that happen? Yep. Everybody that got out of Egypt alive that night came out under the blood and through the water led by the Spirit. Everybody. Everybody. But the Lord saved them out of Egypt but afterward Cut them off before they got to the promised land. They started off headed in the right direction. But they didn't make it all the way. Okay. Verse number six. We're going to take it to another level now. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting change under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. What's verse number six telling what, when it happened? What happened in verse number six? Hell got created. Because the Bible tells us that hell was created for the devil and his angels. Here's what happened. A third of the angels that were in heaven with the Lord, which Lucifer was one of them, a third of them got kicked out of heaven the same day he did because they lined themselves with him against God. Okay? Now, verse 7. Even as, are you ready for this? Sodom and Gomorrah. You almost can't say Sodom and Gomorrah without going, ooh. 
and the cities. There were two more cities. There were five cities all together on the plain. One of them lived Zoar. The other four were destroyed. We just talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. But look at here. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication. That doesn't mean just having sex outside of marriage. That means having all kinds of immoral sexual behavior. All right? And going after strange flesh. That means having sex in ways you were never intended to do. Are set forth as are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, here's what these three have in common. Y'all, y'all ready? Put your saddle on. Let's ride, okay? These all had something in common. They were once a part of the people of God, or at least in the presence of God, and they were operating fully as they were intended. They were operating in the place for which they were created, as God intended for them to do. In the Exodus, they came out under the blood and through the water, but at some point, their faith deteriorated to the extent that they could not escape the judgment of the wilderness. Missing out on the promised land. The angels aligning themselves with Lucifer. He who would elevate himself above God. Why did he get kicked out of heaven? Because he said, I believe I'm better than you. I believe I'm set on that throne. I believe I can do this better than you. He exalted himself above God. And the Lord said, I saw him kicked out of heaven like lightning fall from heaven. All right? Now, these angels that lined themselves with the devil, they received the same reward as the devil. Expelled from heaven, residing in chains, reserved for eternal judgment, which means they got no way to get back. And of course, Sodom and Gomorrah, long-time representatives of those that spiraled away from godly living into a depravity that resulted in heavenly judgment and damnation in spite of an intercessor who talked God down to sparing them if he could find 10 righteous. and He couldn't find it. All of these are witnesses. All of these five, six, and seven are all witnesses. Somebody say witnesses of what? Thank you very much. They are witnesses of the effect they are witnesses of the effect of ungodly influence upon them why does that matter to the addressees of the book of Jude why is it a warning because some sneaky peats have come in. And if they don't wake up, they're going to be deceived. And the warning is, you better wake up. You better open your eyes. This ain't the first time. Ah, Holy Ghost, help me right now. Why do you think the devil keeps doing this? Because it works. It works. Look at here. These are all witnesses of the effect of ungodly influence. Oh, Holy Ghost, help me. Man, I feel the power of God right now. Coming out of the promised land, 12 spies went into the land, and they come out, and all of them said it was just as good as God promised. It's a wonderful land. It flows with milk and honey. And they even brought back souvenirs from the promised land. Grapes, a cluster of grapes that was so big, took two men to carry them, along with figs and pomegranates. But 10 of them said, ain't no way we can go in there. I know what God said, but we saw giants and we saw walled cities. And what's more, we looked like grasshoppers to them. And Joshua and Caleb said, we go up at once. So we got 10 no's and two yeses. 
Hear me now. I'm in the Holy Ghost. We got ten no's and two yeses. And very soon, the entire nation of Israel lined themselves up with the ten no's until the people... Oh, Holy Ghost, help me. My God, have mercy. Until the ten no's said the only way they could get the yeses to shut up was to say... If you don't shut up, we're going to kill you. And while we're at it, we're going to kill Moses too. Brother Ronnie, they threatened to stone him. To get, and the next thing you know, the entire nation of Israel is on a 40-year wandering in the wilderness when they stood on the brink of the promised land because they allowed themselves to be influenced by doubters. One third of the angels bought into whatever stupid snake oil that the devil was selling. He said, I believe I can put the Lord out of here. I believe I can take him over. It was a revolt in heaven. And one third of them aligned themselves with the devil thinking they could. And the Lord kicked them out with his finger, Ezekiel says. No doubt buoyed. By the Lucifer's message of sedition and rebellion and believing that they too would be elevated above the angels that stayed with the Lord, they found themselves kicked out of heaven because of ungodly influence. Sodom and Gomorrah, old lot, raised like a son by Abraham, the father of the faithful. Raised in the fear of the Lord, raised experiencing the blessings of the Lord. He selfishly and arrogantly chose to pitch his tents towards Sodom. And the very next time we see him, he's sitting in the place of authority and honor in the gate of Sodom. And now he has become a big man in a small town. Sucked into her lifestyle. Big man in Sodom who lost nearly his whole family. And so his righteous soul was vexed by hanging around. The Bible said Lot's righteous soul was vexed by the filthy conversation of the wicked. That word conversation means manner of life. Sister Maria, it says Lot hung out with these crazy folks so much that it messed him up forever. Big dummy goes to a cave and his daughters get him drunk and sleep with him and have incestuous children. The common denominator is they all fell under the influence from an outward factor under the way of the world. There was no limit to their depravity. And all that happened, all that happened was they catered to their own selfish will. Where does this inclination come from? Did they dream this sinful stuff up on their own? No. These came from these that have crept in. And all these that have crept in are, are a bridge from the world in which they've lived and the system under which she operates. The way of the world is not the way of the church. It never has been. It's never meant to be. And we've got to make sure that we shake ourselves awake and declare to ourselves, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The world is reveling in the pleasures of sin and the carnally minded look at them with longing until they have an aha moment. And Brother Shannon, they say, since we can't do anything to earn salvation, it's a free gift, then why do we even have to worry about how we behave? Why are we living under this oppression if we're saved without works? And they created a religion a way to be saved and live a life free from any limitations from God. There has been, come on, Lord, I'm going to need you to stop that clock. No, I'm coming, I'm coming down the home stretch. There has been, by definition, an immovable, is this okay? 
by definition, an immovable gulf established between the way of the world and the church ever since the church was born. Matthew 16 and 18 says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That word church comes from the Greek word ecclesia, which means comes from two root words. One means out from and two. Helps word studies properly defines ecclesia as a people called out from the world to God. That's the church. Look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. I told you, put your saddle on, get ready to ride because we're going somewhere, baby. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. They're not dumb. They're not ignorant. They're not unreachable. Here's what happened. In whom the God of this world has blinded their minds. If I live that way, I'm going to have to give up too much. Has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Light stands for two things. Number one, knowledge. Number two, direction. It is the mission of the God of this world to keep them that are lost from finding their way across that gulf from the world to the church. The desire, so the way, the way that these people who have crept in work is, they're now preaching a message that has brought the world to the church and they no longer, no longer need to cross anything. They can stay just like they are and be saved. And there's no doubt a part of their deceptive message is we could win the world if we become a little more like them and a little less harsh and restrictive. So how do you blind somebody's mind? How do you blind somebody's mind? Hmm? How many of us have trouble Believing, I heard somebody breathe a little heavy. That's all right, I'm about done. <laughs> How many of us have had a little, have found ourselves unable to believe that our precious darlings could do anything wrong? <laughs> First thing, my kid gets in trouble, I'm getting in my truck, and I'm going around town, and I'm going to find whoever's fault it is. Because it ain't my baby. You know what happened right then? Your mind got blinded. Because you know in your heart that that little knucklehead's guilty. But we get our minds blinded, Brother Ronnie, by personal feelings and desires. I don't want to believe he's a knucklehead. I don't want to believe that. So if I can find, that's why when you get messed up, you want to go fight with somebody else and try to find somebody else who's just a little bit more messed up than you are. Because our minds are blind. If I can get the focus off of me and onto them, then I'm good. Come on, the devil, the devil will get you looking around everybody you go to church with and try to find somebody just a little bit worse than you. So you can justify staying like you are. Come on now. The way you blind somebody's mind is you change the definition of justification. And you now justify yourself according to what you want. Think about how foolish that is that we will establish lifestyle patterns and behaviors pointed towards something that ain't even real. 
It's just how we wish it was. Conclusion. Titus chapter 2, verse number 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. You know what that means? Everybody can be saved. But they ain't right now. I'm going to teach you this real fast. What is grace? No. It's a door in the side of a boat. 1st time we ever heard about grace is Genesis chapter number 6 and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And you know what grace said? Build this great big boat. And you build it just exactly like I said build it and you build it out of the material that I said build it out of and you put the door where I said put it and you put the window where I said put it and you bring the animals on there just like I said. They loaded them up two by two but there wasn't two of every animal. There was seven of clean animals and two of dirty animals. That's just a little Sunday school lesson to tell you. Wasn't just two of everyone. But when the rain came, or when, the, when it came time, when God said, get on the boat, that's when Noah was saved. He was not saved till he went through the door. You're not saved just because grace is floating around. You're saved because grace gave you a door to walk in. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That means same plan for everybody. God does not grade on the curve. He doesn't find somebody who's a solid C and make them the standard for everybody else. Instead, he became the standard for everybody else. Huh? He said, I can't find no man who'll stand in the gap. So I'm going to be one. Teaching us, this is what grace does, teaching us that denying ungodliness, you know what that means? What's denying ungodliness mean? Mean the Lord, that the grace of God takes it away from you? No, what does it mean when you deny something? Push it off. Say no. <laughs> oh, Lord. When somebody pulls a bag out at a party and rolls up a pretty little uh, cigarillo, lefties, ganja, I got high one time off contact and I think I'm an expert now. <laughs> Listen, listen, when somebody, when some, you'd be surprised what I learned at that boy's ranch. I wasn't the only one doing any teaching. I'll tell y'all some funny stories sometimes of some stupid things I did right off the jump that was, that made them think I was the coolest supervisor they was ever going to have in the world. But somebody comes with a, with a bag and puts it in some paper and rolls it up and says, boy, you got to try this. You know what denying is? I'm good. I'm good. No, deny ungodliness. If it don't line up with the word of God, I got to say no. And worldly lust, that's desire as defined by the world. Okay. So the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us. That means we're in a schoolhouse, Brother Shannon. It's a process. It's an education. It's not Shazam. But you gotta, oh Lord, you gotta be willing to sign up to go to school in his schoolhouse and say, oh, I want to be more like you. I don't want to try to find a shortcut. I don't want to try to find an easy way. I want to be more like you. I want to affect my world like you affected your world. So teach me. 
Remember that, Jen? You remember that first time we ever met? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, that means clear-headed, and all that comes with it, righteously and godly in this present world. That means the world that we live in. Next verse. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Looking. It's the same word that describes what happens when we look at the world and are attracted to them. By definition, that word looking. Oh, I, please forgive me for hurrying, but I got to get to this. That word looking by definition means to welcome with rep, reciprocity. And it's the same word we use when looking at the world. Because you know what, Sister Maria? We've always got a choice. I can look for Jesus or I can look for Motley Crue. The Beatles. No, I don't be listening to that new stuff. I don't know it. But here's the deal. All that that represents doesn't mean Motley Crue and them's going to hell. Please don't, don't tell nobody I said that. All right? But my point is the system that the world operates under and the way of Jesus Christ. I got to look it. Where I'm going is where I'm looking. If you're looking at the world and trying to follow Jesus, I got three words for you. Remember Lot's wife. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Hear me now when I tell you we need a revival of believing that the trumpet could sound any minute. We got to stop thinking that it's going to be a lot of years before the Lord comes. We got to start looking for Him to split those eastern skies every day. You got to wake up in the morning and part of your prayers got to be this might be the day that the trumpet sounds and you call me home. And stop looking at the world. Let me, let me, let me go, 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 let me go. who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. All, that word iniquity means lawlessness. That means Calvary has the power to deliver you from any sin that the world has ever known. All iniquity. That he might buy us back, redeem us from the way of the world, Iniquity means living without any restrictions, living without any laws, living without any rules, just doing it my way, my thing, however I want it. And purify unto himself a peculiar people. That word peculiar does not mean weird. That word peculiar means a people that are set aside especially for God. He's making himself a bride. Zealous of good works. What would be fit that into our context? Rather than zealous of trying to find a way to be worldly and saved at the same time. Amen. Just get excited about pursuing God. Wow. Let's move over real quickly to Romans 12 and I quit. In the New Living Translation... And so, dear brothers and sisters, did I give you that one? Romans 12, 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. You can't sacrifice part of you. It's all or nothing. Say, I'm living for God with my heart, but I'm living for my honey with my body. Lie. 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 
If you hold back anything, you haven't sacrificed. Give your bodies. You know what happens, Brother Blake, when I give my body? It's all of me. My mind is in my body. My heart is in my body. My soul is in my body. I don't have a way to separate the two. Give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them, that's your body, be a living and holy sacrifice. The kind he will find acceptable. I love it. This is truly the way to worship him. I'm in the New Living Translation. Remember, this is written to believers. This is written to the church. And he says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. Brother Ronnie, that's about as plain as this right here. Don't let the world be your influence. And here's what I'm going to say. Start praying that it doesn't matter so much. But let God transform you. That word transform is, Miss Jane, y'all love this. You other girls probably don't know it unless they've been teaching it. But you know what that word is? comes from the Greek word metamorpho. Oh. And you know what it means? It's the same word when a caterpillar is transformed into a butterfly. It's the same word. Oh, my goodness, Sister Maria. It means there's going to be a change that's evident. You ain't even the same person you used to be. By the renewing, by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Next verse. No. Is that my notes? No, no. Look at here. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. By changing the way you think. This is a process. This is a process, and it's working in my mind. You think this that God ain't got this stuff together, Brother Shannon? You guys think God ain't got this stuff together? He's trying to tell us something. I want to change your life. I want to change your world. And then I want to use you to change everybody else around you. I got something for you. I got something for you. I got plans for you. I got dreams for you. But you can't be. You can't win them by being like them. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 and 6. It's a process. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Stand with me. Please. They're all around us, Brother Blake. The allure, the attraction. The enemy's not coming trying to deceive me with a bottle of Jack Daniels, Brother Shannon. already established that. He's not coming with something that might bother you. But he knows what bothers you. He knows what he can use to drag you down, to steal you, kill you, and destroy you because that's all he came for. I don't know where we'll go from here. But we've laid the foundation for us to learn who we need to be in Jesus Christ. And I don't know, it doth not yet appear what we shall be like. But we will be like him. Brother Blake, I don't even really know ever where we're going. But I do know it don't look nothing like where we've been. I'm going to see you that one and raise you one more. I ain't going to be nothing like I was then. Here we are again. Y'all might have to learn this. The song says to the devil, if you only knew 
what I was going to be after the storm, you wouldn't have never bothered me. You would have never messed with me if you knew what I was going to be. Because you see, it was Panina that drove Hannah to her knees. And she touched God. And a little baby boy was born named Samuel who was going to lead the nation of Israel to the Messiah. Amen. And it wouldn't have happened without the enemy pushing it. That's right. Lord, I love you tonight. I love your word. I love truth, the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful for the revelation that's flowing in this house right now. I'm thankful for the desire that's rising up in people that says, I don't want to find out how little I can do to be saved. I don't want to find out how little I can do to be right, but I want to keep pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. It's not enough to just show up for church an hour or two on Sunday and an hour or two on Wednesday and pray a little bit, maybe one or two days a month, uh, but I've got to be changed. Uh, I've got to be different. Uh, I, want to, I want my life to be like Brother Terrence's life, Lord. Uh, I want people to be able to see a difference in me. I want them to be able to feel a difference in me. Uh, I want them to come up and say, more. what's different about you? God, I don't want to stay like I am. I, I want to, oh, Holy Ghost, uh, I want you, Lord, put me on the wheel. Uh, and mold me and shape me and make me into a vessel that's pleasing unto you. That's all it's about is that I'm pleasing unto you. And that's what we want in Jesus' name. Amen. Sunday morning at 10. Elements class. Be there. Be square. 11 o'clock. Worship. Don't want to miss you. Y'all come. We love you. You're dismissed. Pray for the kids. Pray for the kids. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.